Castle Chansonnet, Volume 1, written by Charlotte e. English and narrated by Diana Croft. The Best of All Chairs When the dragon Jessamine slithered into the wizard Garstang's study in the dark of the night and undulated her way towards the best of all chairs that skulked in a corner, a voice from the shadows took her by surprise. I would not sit there if I were you, said the voice. While disembodied and confusing as to source, it could not be termed alarming, not even though the hour was late and the night dark and silent. The words emerged too sleepily for that, as though the speaker were at least half asleep. Jessamine paused. She had not known the sylphs to frequent the study very often, for the wizard's caprice irritated them, and theirs had the same effect on him. But they were wise in the ways of Castle Chansony, and when they spoke, Jessamine listened. From a distance of a safe three or four feet, Jessamine inspected the chair. Nothing so personal to the wizard Garstang could be modest, either in proportion or design, and so the best of all chairs elevated the concept of splendid to new and dazzling dimensions. The tall, engraved back rose to a height of six feet. The seat was wide enough across to fit at least two people side by side, and the arms were of proportions eminently suited to the king's own throne. Moreover, while the greater part of an old oak tree had already gone into its construction, in the creation of its spectacular frame, the wizard had desired that the thing should be soft as well. Hence the profusion of cushions, in hues of emerald and sapphire and gold, Above all, the best of all chairs advertised itself as expensive. Perhaps you think I will damage it and displease the wizard, said Jessamine. And were it likely that I should, you would be right to prevent me. But my fires are my own and shan't do anything unseemly to the chair. The wizard would never harm his familiar, said the shadowed voice. However clumsy she had been, but no, that was not my concern. Jessamine thought again. Perhaps what stands before me is not the best of all chairs at all, but something else in a clever disguise. She let her tongue unspool and tasted a leg. The flavour, woodsy and old and dry, did not encourage a second taste. Like as not to be with the wizard around, agreed the voice. But no, that was not my concern either. Well then, what is it? said Jessamine, abandoning so unsatisfactory a pursuit. I am tired and I want to sit down on something soft. The chair is in no mood for company, came the answer sleepily and then nothing. No mood, muttered Jessamine. What else does a chair desire but to be sat upon, I should like to know? Nobody answered her, or not right away. A swishing sound came instead, and then into the pool of light, cast by Jessamine's own wreathing fires, there appeared a carpet. It was the thickest one, nicely rounded about the edges and coloured like forest moss. Aren't you supposed to be in front of the hearth? said Jessamine, recognising it. I went for a perambulation, said the carpet, settling itself in its accustomed place with a silky sigh. Refreshing. Occasionally, the carpet, to all appearances, went to sleep. Jessamine nudged it with her snout, and when it did not rouse, she delicately bit the corner. You are rude, said the carpet. I am, said Jessamine, and since that is the case, I shall not hesitate to make use of the best of all chairs, whatever its mood. So saying, she flowed fierily up onto the broad cushioned seat of Wizard Garstang's own chair and curled up. 
Nothing untoward happened. But just as she was dropping into a comfortable doze, someone said lugubriously, I like that. Jessamine stirred. What's that? Personal chair to the court wizard, the mournful voice continued. Every expense lavished upon me, and then I am made over to an apprentice. But I am not an apprentice, said Jessamine. Not now. I'm the familiar. You aren't the wizard, said the best of all chairs. It amounts to the same thing. I should suppose the wizard to be asleep, said Jessamine, or perhaps carousing. She closed her eyes again. His fancy's caught, said the chair. His eyes turned another way, and what is to become of me, I ask you? Jessamine pondered this. I think not, she said. He was always more scornful than otherwise when it comes to the court ladies. The carpet intervened. Child, the chair talks of furniture. Jessamine sat up. The wizard's got another chair. A gift, mourned the best of all chairs, or, as Jessamine now supposed, the second best of all chairs. From the Queen. Why would Queen Milani give the wizard a chair? It, the second best of all chairs, paused, struggling in the grip of some deep emotion. It flies, it managed at last, and fell into a brooding silence. Cannot you fly? Jessamine inquired. I have seen you taking up the best of spots all over the castle. Not as such, mourned the chair. Not like that. Right, Jessamine slithered off the chair. I've got to see this. Jessamine would have felt no surprise if the whole tale were to prove itself nothing but hocus-pocus. What the Queen would want with the wizard such that she would give him a flying chair, well, Jessamine could not imagine. Surely the Queen was too busy ruling the kingdom with the king. What time had she to waste on frivolities such as unusually airborne furniture? But when at last she discovered the wizard, he having proved absent from his bedchamber, she found that the second best of all chairs was right. The wizard did have a new chair. What's more, the gossamer fairy wings sprouting from its four graceful legs and the top of its tall and elegant back suggested that the tales of its powers had not been exaggerated and that the wizard was enchanted with it could not admit of a doubt, for he was sleeping in it. He made no attractive picture, sprawled all over the seat, with his legs thrown carelessly over one spindly arm, this chair not having the robust stoutness of the other, and his head gracelessly lolling. Jessamine supposed him to have been engaged in study of this new marvel, with his customary carelessness of time and tiredness, until he fell asleep where he sat. His sapphire velvet mantle was sadly wrinkled. Jessamine woke him with a waft of cinder-scented air. He stirred, grunted something unflattering, and fell back into slumber. Wizard! Jessamine hissed. Wizard! His dark eyes opened and fixed, unseeing upon Jessamine. You make a spectacle of yourself, she hissed. Being Wizard Garstang, he had not fallen asleep in one of the many dusty corners of the castle, a quiet, out-of-the-way place where no curious eyes could fix upon him. Being Wizard Garstang, it would not have occurred to him to take his prize into some such unobjectionable spot and conduct his investigations there. No, not even though he had an excellent chamber of his own invitingly titled study. The Queen had presented him with his new, splendid chair in the midst of their Majesty's feasting chamber, Jessamine knew, for that was where the wizard had remained, and, having fallen asleep, had acquired, or perhaps retained, an audience of 
two fascinated court ladies in moon-coloured silks, a bard's apprentice, the callow youth trailing a lute and a green mantle much too big for him, a rival wizard from a neighbouring kingdom, judging from the spangled garments he wore, and a pot boy crept out of the kitchens to see the spectacle, not entirely hidden behind the golden brocade skirts of a banqueting table laden with sumptuous delights. Wizard Garstang took in all this in bemused silence. He wakes, cried one of the court ladies, following this enlightening comment with a peal of silvery mirth. We hope your repose has refreshed you, wizard, said her companion more gravely. Yes, said Wizard Garstang, and sprang out of his seat with one of his abrupt, effervescent bursts of energy. A pair of dancers, failing to foresee this possibility, almost collided with him. The wizard's satirical brow rose as he watched them whirl away again, scowling. He did not offer the lady so much as another syllable, but bent over his new chair and became absorbed again in its various contours. He will be looking for evil enchantments, said the rival wizard loftily to the same ladies. It is what any wizard does upon receiving a new wonder into his care. Jasmine's wizard did not favour this with any response at all, deeming it beneath his notice, no doubt. No such thing, said Jessamine firmly, and set the rival wizard's toe on fire with a lick of her tongue. The queen would not give him anything evil. The rival wizard was not long inconvenienced by his flaming footwear, for he smothered Jessamine's promising little blaze with an irritable gesture of his long fingers. The contemplation of the black burn now marring the beauty of his satin slippers distracted him, however, and he did not reply. What are you doing? said Jessamine, turning back to her wizard, for he might be every bit as self-satisfied, know-it-all and tyrannical as this other one, but at least he was hers. Wizard Garstang, absorbed, did not reply. You have broken your best chair's heart, Jessamine persevered, and it's my belief the furniture will be plotting a mutiny. No, no, he murmured, running a gentle hand along the edge of one silken, fluttering chair wing. The carpet will keep them in order. The carpet's asleep. Well, and what else would you expect a carpet to do at this hour? Jessamine sighed and slithered under the table, from which sulking spot she emitted a fine flow of rose-scented smoke. I say, came the wizard's voice, you aren't too attached to these, are you? Jessamine peeked under the hem of the brocade tablecloths. The wizard was chatting with the new best of all chairs, and he had his fingers around the gossamer wings. Flying's awfully dangerous, he continued. A high wind and ill luck and you'll be dashed to pieces against some turret or fallen into the lake. Care to trade? Whatever the chair said in reply, Jessamine could not hear. A soft-spoken thing by appearances, nothing like the deep rumble of the best, no, the second best of all chairs. Jessamine hoped its response was favourable, however, for in another moment the wizard said, Excellent! and, with alacrity, plucked the glorious wings from the chair's high back. He bent, and a few swift gestures secured those adorning its four legs as well. He piled them all onto the seat, picked up the chair, severed wings and all, and made off with it. Jessamine scuttled out from under the table and ran in hasty pursuit. Wizard Garstang pushed his way through the throng of the Queen's feasting chamber, and once out into the passageways kept up a long, rapid stride all the way back to his study. A word, once fairly through the door, set all the sconces aglow, and the furniture woke up with a start. The wizard was no sluggard, when properly inspired. There, he said, a moment later, stepping back to admire his handiwork. No ill effect, I think. The gossamer wings, taken from the Queen's gift, now fluttered gaily from the back of his erstwhile favourite chair, 
its back now extra tall and straight with pride. Jessamine judged. The four smaller wings sprouted jauntily from its thick, heavy legs. The best of all chairs, now restored to all the glory of the position, gambled. Not yet, not yet, said the wizard, not till we get outside. The best of all chairs subsided. They do not match, sniffed Jessamine. The wizard surveyed his chair. You are right, he decided. What do you think? Ruby? No, horrible. You're right, said the wizard again. Silver. Nothing will do for you but gold, said Jessamine. She expected the satirical brow in response to this sally. Instead, she received the glinting smile. Perfect, he decided, and the wings turned a shimmering and stately gold. Jessamine slunk up the legs of the queen's chair, divested of its wings and waiting hopefully nearby. This is my chair, she announced. Wizard Garstang's head came up. Ah, yes, just for a moment. Quite what he did, Jessamine could not tell. She knew only that a surge of magic swept over the chair, smelling unpleasantly of wet mud, and as it passed it left behind it an article of furniture much altered. Oh, spake the carpet softly. That's nice, that. Jessamine dug her claws into the blanket of soft and really scarcely damp moss that now grew upon the seat of her chair and stuck her nose into the nearest of the canopy of rose blooms that hung from the back. The wood itself was no longer a pale deadness of hard edges and turned corners. Now it grew in knots and walls like a tree again, only chair shaped. Charming, said she, with rare sincerity. Just needs one more thing. The sylphs will see to the watering, said Wizard Garstang with a careless wave of his hand. But Jessamine mustered her own blazing magics, a little musty with disuse, but functional enough, and manifested a spray of ribbons winding jauntily up each leg. Those don't match, said Wizard Garstang, which was true enough, for a living tree chair had no use for a set of woven fabric adornments. Yes, yes, they do, said Jessamine, and went to sleep in her chair. <laughs>